1 Corinthians chapter 12. <clears throat> You've heard me say that a few times by now, as uh, this is now the fourth sermon that uh, between Pastor Brian and I, we are preaching from this same passage. We will be uh, beginning our reading in verse 4. <clears throat> Paul says, Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the same Spirit. Do you see a theme here? By the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually, as he wills. And you can be seated. <clears throat> For the past several weeks, we've been working our way through a short series of sermons on the gifts of the Spirit. And this is now the fourth sermon that uh, uh, we are preaching on that subject. And uh, this little mini-series is part of a larger uh, group of sermons that we have been praying on the topic, uh, or preaching on the topic of the Holy Spirit in general and his activity in the church and how he empowers and enlivens the church for the work of the kingdom. And our series on the Holy Spirit has been part of a larger series that we have been working on all the way since last fall entitled, We Believe which has been based on the foundational truths of our Christian faith and reviewing those, kind of following along uh, the pattern of the Apostles' Creed. A couple weeks ago, we surveyed some of what I called the more straightforward gifts of the Holy Spirit, gifts like service and hospitality and administration and some of the other gifts. And as I mentioned then, I promised that uh, we would be looking at some point at the less straightforward gifts, and today is the day. Um, they are the gifts that Paul lists here in this passage, verses 8 through 11, and Paul lists nine specific things that he calls gifts of the Spirit, things that are given. The utterance or word of wisdom the utterance or word of knowledge, faith, which we dealt with actually a couple weeks ago, gifts of healing, the working of miracles, prophecy, the ability to discern between spirits, various kinds of tongues, and the interpretation of tongues. As I was planning out these sermons, I thought that I could address all of these eight in a single day. I was wrong. <clears throat> I realized as I got into it that I could not do justice to this topic and such an important weighty thing, especially for our times in a single service, in a single sermon. So I've divided them into two parts, and we will finish them up next week. Um, if you've been following along, and as I mentioned, you probably have noticed that between Brian and I, this is the fourth sermon pretty much based on this passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In fact, someone from the uh, 8 o'clock service said to me, you know, you don't need to read the text next week because we have it all memorized by now. We've just been there so many times. But the reason why we keep returning to this same passage is pretty simple. It's because it's the most comprehensive treatment of the spiritual gifts in the New Testament, and really that Scripture provides. As I've mentioned, there are other passages where the gifts are mentioned and other lists 
of gifts of the Spirit. But for the most part, those other passages kind of refer to the gifts more in passing than really focusing in on them. But it's here in 1 Corinthians 12 and continuing into chapters 13 and 14 that Scripture offers the most direct treatment of the gifts and what their purpose is. The fact is, though, based on that, that what Scripture provides us in terms of direct explanations or descriptions of these gifts is pretty minimal. Paul and the other apostles who contributed to the New Testament didn't seem to see fit to clearly define the individual gifts. Paul doesn't say, now let me tell you what the gift of prophecy is. Let me tell you what it looks like and how it works. He doesn't do that for us. He doesn't provide detailed instructions about how to use them. Really, in this passage, he, name, he just names them. And he does go on in chapter 14 to give us more detail about the gifts of prophecy and tongues and also the interpretation of tongues. And from the book of Acts, we can glean some good ideas and get some clues about how some of the gifts were used in the early church. But as I've been doing my research and studying for these things, one of the themes that has come across to me from the scholars that I've been looking to is that even those who have devoted years of their lives to the study of these things often confess that they find themselves with more questions than answers. And that should sound a note of caution for us in a couple ways. First, we ought to draw our conclusions carefully and humbly. Where clear instruction is limited, it's always tempting to want to fill in the blanks. Fill in the blanks with conclusions that we may draw from our own experience or from our lack of experience or from our own background, whatever heritage we may have come from. And that tendency is certainly true with regard to these gifts that Paul lists here in 1 Corinthians 12. Because of that, many of the ideas about the spiritual gifts that um, that are out there, many of the common perceptions and ideas are not strictly biblical. And I don't mean to say that they're wrong or heretical. It just means that they are not resting on clear biblical teaching because the Bible itself doesn't provide clear biblical teaching. Consequently, there has been a significant amount of controversy and confusion and misunderstanding surrounding all of those things. And that's not just in our time, but really through the centuries, as Christians have tended to fill in the blanks and then kind of insist that however they filled in the blanks is how everybody should fill in the blanks. So today we're going to clear up all of that. <laughs> See me after, I have swampland in Florida too. <laughs> but that's the first caution. As we approach these things, we should do so with caution and humility. We should hold fast to what Scripture does say, and then we should give each other room for differing perspectives, as long as those perspectives fall within the parameters that good biblical understanding provide. The second caution that I would suggest is that we should be careful not to make too much of something that Scripture itself doesn't emphasize. 
Alistair Begg, who is one of my favorite Bible teachers, has a saying that he repeats with some frequency. He says, the main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things. Kind of like the rain in Spain. In other words, we should expect that those things that are less clear in Scripture are less critical and central to our faith and to a life of discipleship than those things that are more clear in Scripture. And there are things that God makes very, very clear in Scripture because he wants to be sure that we understand them and we grasp them and we hold on to them. When we become unduly preoccupied with those things that are less clear, we run the risk of losing sight of the things that are most important. And I can remember having that experience myself growing up in uh, a tradition that really emphasized the end times. And uh, they had the maps and all the you know, all the charts and everything else laid out, and they were pretty clear they knew it, they knew it, and if you didn't agree, they were pretty clear you might not make it, right? (laughs) But as I matured in my own faith, one of the things that I came to realize is that Jesus had gotten lost in the shuffle, And he had become God's love for us in Christ. And the focus on exalting Christ had become diminished while these other things had become important. And the same is true of the gifts that Paul lists here. We should not dismiss them because they are unclear. Any more than we should dismiss questions about the end times because they are unclear. But neither should we make more of them than is warranted by Scripture itself. So let's make a start. Keeping those cautions in mind and recognizing that what I offer you is not biblical absolutes, but conclusions that I have arrived at and hold humbly with openness based on my own study and my own prayer and my own reflection. I've uh, um, used a lot of what I consider really balanced and valuable resources. If you'd like more study, I can recommend a book to you by Michael Green. Uh, It's one of the classic works on the Holy Spirit. It's entitled, I Believe in the Holy Spirit. So write that down or get the recording and you'll find it after. I want to notice also that Paul groups these gifts together in this section kind of in twos, except for the gift of faith, which kind of stands on its own. And I think that that uh, is something we ought to take note of, because I think um, what Paul is doing is he is speaking rhetorically. (laughs) He, uh, as is often the case when people speak rhetorically, when I do, I will sometimes pair up my adjectives in order to emphasize a point or bring attention to something. And Paul is pairing things up, not necessarily to create hard and fast prescriptions or clear lines, but actually in order to convey that a rhetorical idea of these things go together. And so the lines between them may be kind of blurry, and the distinctions and the definitions may not be hard and fast. So he talks about words of knowledge and words of wisdom. He talks about faith, which kind of stands on its own. He talks about healings and works, working of miracles, about prophecy and distinguishing between spirits, and about tongues and the interpretation of tongues. I want to start with prophecy, which is further down on this list, but which Paul gives preeminence to um, among the other gifts. If you'll notice, if your Bibles are open, you can notice in chapter 14 and verse 1, 
Paul says, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. Pastor Brian um, spoke about that um, last week. The examples of prophecy in the New Testament vary um, quite a bit. You may remember that there was a man in the book of Acts named Agabus who the community of faith had come to see as a prophet. And he, in Acts chapter 11, predicted the famine that ultimately would come upon the Roman world and would affect the church. He also predicted later on in the book of Acts that if Paul went to Jerusalem, which was his plan to do, at that time Agabus was in Ephesus and Paul was leaving Ephesus, Agabus uh, predicted that if Paul went to Jerusalem, he would be captured and he would be imprisoned and he would be held over for judgment by the Romans. Timothy was prophesied over during his commissioning service. And Paul talks about that in 1 Timothy chapter 4. And it seems that in that service, someone prophesied that Timothy would receive the gift of teaching, which he indeed indeed, uh, did receive. And he became a great help to Paul because he had received that gift. And in other places in the New Testament, prophecy is associated with edification and teaching, and encouragement. Sometimes prophecy is um, confined to preaching and teaching, and I'm not sure the New Testament gives us the latitude to confine it that much. But I do think that one thing we should be cautious about is not to use the Old Testament prophets as the model for how we should understand what Paul is talking about here. Even in the Old Testament, prophecy was not primarily the telling of the future. Prophecy was speaking the word of the Lord. And the prophets, time and time again, used that language, hear the word of the Lord, or this is the word of the Lord. And often the word of the Lord came to warn those who were faithless and to encourage and to comfort those who were faithful. When Paul talks about the gift of prophecy, and this is a distinction from the Old Testament, there's no suggestion that he considers those who have that gift to have the same kind of authority as the revealed word of God, as the scriptures. And I think that's really important because there is a mindset right now that is gaining popularity, that new prophets are offering new revelation that replace this. That is a dangerous, dangerous road to walk. In fact, perhaps anticipating the gifts of the Spirit that would soon be given to them, Jesus made it clear to the disciples in John chapter 16 in the upper room that the Spirit would not speak of his own accord, but that he would take what the Father and the Son have already revealed and he would make it clear to them. So the work of the Spirit in that regard is not to reveal new revelation, but to clarify and help us to understand what God has revealed already. In chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, Paul indicates two primary purposes for prophecy. First of all, in chapter in verse 4, he mentions that it is valuable for believers in order to build up the body. And in verse 22, he goes on to say, The one who prophesies speaks to people for the upbuilding and encouragement and consolation of the church. So that is the one purpose. It is for believers, for building them up, for building up and strengthening the body. 
In verses 24 and 25, he says it is also valuable for unbelievers. Because when an unbeliever might attend a service such as this, and they hear the word of God spoken, and they hear God's people prophesying, they would be convicted of sin. And that prophecy, the word of God, would disclose the secrets of their hearts so that they might come to repentance. And both of those are important. <clears throat> so based on that, I think it's, I, I would urge caution toward those who would use prophetic revelation of some kind to tell us what to think or what to do or what not to do. Rather, those with the gift of prophecy will appeal to God's word time and time again. They will appeal to God's word and offer insight provided by the Spirit to encourage and to warn and to convict and to offer direction and counsel from his word for the circumstances that we may face as a body in order that we might be built up. And prophecy, if you think about it, and what Paul, goes, Paul also says, is you, you can sense that there are some similarities then between prophecy and what Paul calls the utterance or word of wisdom. The word of, root of wisdom is rooted in wisdom, right? So it's important that we know what wisdom is. And when we read scripture, especially the book of Proverbs, what is, what is clear is that wisdom is rooted in God's character, and it's also rooted in his perfect design and ordering of creation. It is out of his wisdom that he has ordered all things perfectly. And the wise then, especially if you read in the book of Proverbs, the wise are those who understand God's character. And the wise are those who can see and perceive how creation has been ordered by God's wisdom and then conform their lives to the order of creation that we live in harmony with that order. So we should expect that those with the spiritual gift of wisdom would have an intimate knowledge of God's word and of his character. And that they would be gifted by the spirit to discern how his character and how the wisdom that is revealed in the ordering of creation how those things come to bear on our lives, on our circumstances, on the things that we face in our times. A great example of that, I think, is in Acts chapter 15, when the council of elders met in Jerusalem to consider the question of the Gentiles. Do you remember that? I hope you remember that. And the question was, what do we do? <laughs> what do we do with these Gentiles that are coming to faith in Jesus Christ? Are they, do they belong to us? How do we treat them? What, what do we do? And as they met together, they wrestled with these questions, no doubt depending on the Holy Spirit. And after hearing the testimony of Paul and Barnabas, Luke tells us, James stood up and spoke a word of wisdom to the entire group. He quoted from the prophet Amos, where the prophet Amos talked about God's eternal plan, the order of creation, what is God doing? Well, his intention, says the prophet, is that the Gentiles would be included in his ultimate purpose for history. And based on that then, on that spirit-led insight that James provided into God's character and his purposes, the decision was made not to place unnecessary obstacles in the way of Gentiles who were coming to faith. And that same kind of spirit-directed insight can assist God's people 
in all kinds of circumstances with all kinds of needs. In a counseling situation where the limits of our wisdom and understanding have been far surpassed by the demands of the circumstances. In meetings where difficult decisions have to be made. Or when conflict needs to be addressed and reconciliation is being sought. And I often find myself praying, Lord, give us wisdom by your spirit. Be with us that we might see your character. Because wherever you are, there is wisdom. Wherever you are, there is peace and reconciliation. And then, when we seek that wisdom from the Lord, we trust that God will provide the wisdom that we need through those who are godly, through those who are following God's word and living according to his ways. Because if they're living according to his ways, they're walking in wisdom. And they can offer us that insight to help us. The third thing I want to note is similar, and that is words of knowledge. Uh, Often, uh, Peter's Uh, um, interaction with Ananias and Sapphira is considered an example of a word of knowledge. Peter was given insight into their hidden motives. So the knowledge that Paul is referring to here is not really just uh, knowledge of facts, kind of like, you know, special gift for Jeopardy. That's not what Paul is referring to here. He's referring to special insight into the human heart. The ability empowered by the Spirit to untangle the web of human motives and put one's finger on the real issues. Do you have people like that in your life? I have people that like that in my life. Do you find <laughs> that sometimes your own Thinking and self-reflection is so tangled that you're not sure how to find your way through it. And yet, I have people that I trust that are able to penetrate the fog and hit the mark and say, this, I think, may be what your struggle is. And then I say, why didn't I think of that? The word of knowledge. The ability empowered by the Spirit to put your, their finger on your heart and reveal to you things that you didn't know were there. Sometimes those who have that gift may not even be aware that they are the vessel. Which kind of goes back to what I said a couple of weeks ago, right? If the gifts start with service, then the people of God are going to recognize your gifts probably before you even do. So they may not be aware that they are the vessel that God is using to reveal things to us. And I find that to be true for myself. Often in Bible study or worship, someone will share an insight or an observation that speaks to me directly, either words of conviction or encouragement, or exhortation. And sometimes God may use unlikely vessels to reveal ourselves to us. Some of you may have heard the story that Sharon tells from time to time about the time after her divorce when she was seeking truth. She had not yet come to faith in Christ, but she was seeking truth. And uh, having been divorced, the natural thing to do in the 70s was to get back into the scene. And so Sharon was partying in a bar, and an acquaintance who she knew but uh, happened to be drunk at the time sauntered up to the table and sat down next to her. And she says that uh, 
For just a brief moment, his eyes cleared and he became perfectly sober. And he said to her, what are you doing here? This place isn't for you. You don't belong here. Then his eyes clouded over again and he wandered away. That was a word of knowledge to her. God putting his finger on her heart and saying, this is you, I see you. And Sharon didn't go back. Finally, the gift of discernment. That's four. We'll look at four others next week. Aren't you glad? We're not going to do all eight. Paul calls it distinguishing between spirits. And that gift is vital to the life of the church. The gifts are good. But like any good thing, they can be abused, they can be misused, and they can be hijacked by the evil one. And their potential for abuse is really equal to their potential for good. And that's why John says in 1 John 4 and verse 1, he says, Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Scripture is clear that what may appear to be the activity of the spirit is not necessarily the work of the spirit. And not every message that purports to originate with the Spirit is actually from the Spirit. Sometimes, the motives behind false manifestations of the Spirit are sincere. Sometimes they can be very self-serving and even evil. Because there is great power in the claim that I speak for God. There's a lot of power in that. It's that kind of power that enabled Joseph Smith to convince a bunch of people to surrender their young daughters to him so that they could be his wives. Those who have the gift of discerning the spirits help the church to navigate these waters by helping to distinguish whether something purporting to be from the Spirit is truly from God or not. And that takes us back, doesn't it, to the centrality of Scripture. Scripture is the final standard, both in terms of what we believe about the gifts and in terms of our experience of the gifts. Is Christ exalted? Or is attention being diverted away from Christ to some other thing? Is human pride being fed? Or is the body of Christ being built up? Is the result unity? Or is it divisiveness? Is the power attached to the gifts being used to build up the body? Or is it being used to control? And manipulate. Those are all litmus tests that Scripture gives us to help us discern what is authentic and what isn't. And those with the gift of distinguishing the spirits, like those with the gift of wisdom, I would suggest are equipped by the Spirit with insight into God's Word, into His character and into his purposes so that they can answer those questions for the good of the body. So that the body is built up in love by the authentic work of the Spirit and not tossed about by the winds and waves of counterfeit experience. A couple of examples to kind of help it be more concrete. They may stretch you a bit. I know someone who had a friend who was convinced that they needed to speak in tongues. And so this friend would often talk about that. And one day the friend came to them and said, you know, I had a dream 
And in that dream, I saw myself with a plate overflowing with food, and you had your plate, and there was just a little bit on it. And the implication was, you don't speak in tongues, so you're missing out on all this stuff. That's not biblical. Scripture can easily dispense with that kind of prophetic word because it doesn't line up with what God's word says. On another occasion, some of you may have been there, um, some of our ladies attended a seminar, and uh, actually it turned out to be a, um, more of a charismatic kind of seminar, or I guess it was a, it was a, um, a, a retreat that, uh, um, than, than what we are accustomed to anyways. And in the course of that, there was an event where people were being um, slain in the spirit and they were falling over. And there were questions about how should, the, you know, our ladies were saying, how, what do we do with this? How do we understand this? And one of the ladies who was, had been diagnosed with cancer fell over. And a couple of our ladies actually witnessed flames licking her body from the lower part right out through her head. What do you do with that? So they asked her about it. What do you think happened? Do you think that you were healed from your cancer in that event? And she said, I don't know if I was healed or not. But she said, I was deathly afraid for my children and what would happen if I die? And now the fear is gone. That's the evidence of the Spirit. Whatever else might have happened. She later died of cancer. She wasn't healed, but she was healed. So as we close, let me suggest two principles to help us navigate, and I'll offer more next week. First of all, be very careful before you presume to speak for God. That is a caution that I remind myself of every time I walk up to this pulpit. God did not take kindly to those who claimed to speak for him, but were actually advancing their own agenda in Scripture. I've been reading through the prophet Jeremiah, and several prophets in, the, in, in Jeremiah are, are uh, saying to him, ah, oh, Jeremiah's wrong, and we're right, and uh, those prophets didn't live very long. God has spoken clearly and thoroughly in his word. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, Peter reminds us that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. So before you presume to speak in his name, make sure that what you say aligns with what he has already said and it aligns with who he is and what he is like. Secondly, keep your eyes on God. Desire him first. He is the main thing. And he is the plain thing. Give priority to the authority of his word in your life. As I look around me, I see people who get excited by the words of this prophet or that prophet. But one of the things that I often observe is those people that are most excited don't actually know God's word very well themselves. And there are a lot of people who claim to speak for God that are banking on the fact that you don't know God's word and you won't be able to discern what is coming from their agenda and what's coming from God. Be open for God to work in unusual ways. That's what he does. Expect to hear him speak 
through his people. Expect it. Anticipate it. And at the same time, keep your feet planted firmly in the word. We can trust that if we earnestly seek him, God will provide what we need so that the body is built up, so that he is exalted, and so that Christ is made known. That is the main thing, and that is the plain thing. Would you pray with me as our worship team comes? Father, we wrestle with these things. I wish you'd given us more. (laughs) But I know you have your purposes to have not given us more than you have in your word to help us understand how to navigate these things. And my sense is that you have not given us more because you want our eyes on you. And I pray that you will help us to keep our eyes on you, that you would give us the wisdom and discernment that we need to find our way through difficult things, to understand them and to use them rightly, not to be afraid of them or to dismiss them, but to use them as you intend us to, for your glory, for the good of your people. Help us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Peace to you, brothers and sisters in Christ. Go in the power of the Holy Spirit and live abundantly, keeping your feet planted in the word and your hearts open to all that God would do in you, for you, and through you. Amen. God bless you.